Middle East Institute, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome our global audience to today's arts panel, Adapting and Innovating in the Face of COVID-19. We're looking today at how the Middle East creative communities are responding to the pandemic, what role they believe that the arts and artists can play in helping communities through these difficult times, and how the crisis is reshaping their priorities and their thinking about the future. We are so fortunate and so, so grateful to be joined today by such a stellar cast of speakers, including our moderator. But before I introduce them, I just want to provide a few housekeeping notes. We will be taking audience questions in the last 15 minutes of our hour-long event. So for those of you watching this panel via Zoom, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and you can submit questions in writing through that portal. For those calling in by phone or watching our panel on MEI's live stream, you can submit your questions on Twitter by tagging at MEI Arts Culture or through email at events at MEI.edu. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the panel. Our moderator will get them, uh, will get to them in the last 15 minutes. And if you have any technical issues, please email events at MEI.edu. Now back to our panel. With us today are Nadine Labaki, Oscar nominated filmmaker speaking from her home in Lebanon, Huel Qasimi, director of the Sharjah Art Foundation and the Sharjah Art Biennial, speaking from the UAE, and Tunisian French artist and activist, El Cid, speaking from the studio in Dubai. Moderating today's conversation is Chase Robinson. He's the Dame Gillian Sackler Director of the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery and Freer Gallery of Art at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Their complete bios can be found on our website. They're joining us as part of a series of podcasts, videos, and panels that MEI's Arts and Culture Center is running, featuring voices and insights from the region's creative communities responding to life under COVID. I wanna thank our participants for joining this talk. It's such an honor to have such visionaries and arts leaders help us to look ahead and reflect on how COVID is changing our respective worlds, elf, elf shukur, as they say in Arabic. And now I'd like to turn the panel over to our moderator, Chase Robinson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. It's a, it's a great pleasure to join you today. Um, we have, according to the most recent account, over 550 attendees, which I think uh, speaks a great deal to the work that our colleagues at the Middle East Institute are doing, and of course, to the extraordinary utility of, of the technology, which allows us to bridge some of the distance that we're currently all feeling both personally and institutionally. I should say for those of you who don't know that the National Museum of Asian Art um, and uh, the Middle East Institute share a common geography, of course, here in DC, but more important than that, we share a common mission and that is to foster the understanding, appreciation, respect for the arts and cultures of the Middle East um, and indeed at the Museum of the Middle East and Asia as a whole. It is an extraordinary uh, pleasure, indeed a privilege, um, to have the opportunity to share a bit of time uh, globally, as Kate said, with three remarkable speakers um, joining us today, as she said, from Beirut, from Sharjah, and from Dubai. Um, I'd like to begin the questions um, and the conversation with El Cid, and I'd like, like to put to you um, really a two-part question, if I may. Many in our audience, many of those attending will be interested to know what are the conditions on the ground right now, um, given the lockdown in Dubai. So I'll ask you to speak a little bit to the conditions as they currently are today in Dubai. Um, and then, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and be as free as you wish in answering the question, how you're coping with the current constraints. Uh, I think our audience certainly, I'd be very keen to know how you're responding given uh, your own art practices, which are, as many will know, um, uh, uh, very much embedded in society, in communities, how you're responding yeah. to the current circumstances. Sure. So yeah, so definitely I'm uh, like you mentioned, I'm locked down here. Uh, I'm locked in, uh, in in Dubai, uh, not in my studio because uh, I'm at home uh, for like actually the past uh, the past three weeks. So um, uh, I have a studio here in Dubai and a studio in Tunis in Tunisia in the capital. But right now during the COVID nineteen, I'm uh, uh, I'm here in Dubai. And uh, uh, honestly, I, I was traveling. Me, uh, I came back to the UAE on 
March 13, so I uh, confined myself for two weeks. I was not uh, going out. I was not sure you had anything. Or and then um, for the past few days, it's uh, it's a full lockdown here in Dubai. So you also need to register online if you want to uh, to go out, uh, do your grocery. Um, you know, like uh, honestly, as a as an artist. I, I was mentioning earlier that, uh, you know, before we started the panel, that it's, uh, it's a new reality for me because um, my work, because of my work, I travel a lot. So I, I rarely spare, uh, spend more than two weeks at home. So uh, being here like for more than three weeks, almost four weeks, um, actually, it's a, it's a new reality. And to be honest with you, I, um, I realize like time is uh, such a luxury and I'm doing it. Uh, a lot, even if I, uh, even if I, my practice as as an artist is really linked to uh, to communities is with the interaction with with people because I I I, I work in the public space. Um, I think I, I use this time to uh, I think to come stronger and more prepared for uh, for when the lockdown is over. Like, so we have so many projects that uh, my team and I were working on, and so now we're just trying to uh, dig more into it, make sure that. Uh, everything is ready when everything will be over to, uh, to start in the, in the best way. And if I may follow up, what is, what is morale like? How do people feel? Do you have a sense of, uh, of uh, how communities are, are responding and, and the you degree know, to which people... Please. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, my, my studio here in Dubai is in a place called Al Sarkal Avenue, you know, and... Um, and you know, like the lockdown happened like during the, the art season. So, uh, you know, that was supposed to have the art fair in the end of March and like uh, gallery opening. And uh, so I think uh, it affected a lot of people, but uh, I, I feel there is a, a kind of community gathering, you know, mainly online to make sure that uh, everybody's trying to take care of the other one, seeing like if you need anything or like what would be the next step, you know, what will happen after the COVID or how, as artists, could uh, can we uh, sustain ourselves? You know what I mean. When you we have projects that are planned, I don't know for April, March, May, and then you know that everything is cancelled. Uh, when as an artist, me uh, I live mostly from um, not commission that I do in the street, but mostly for my work that I do in my studio. And knowing I had a show that opened in Miami like three weeks ago, and the gallery uh, stay open for three days, and then they had to. Sh- uh, I mean, to, to close the gallery. So there is a lot of, um, I think, a lot of um, concern that inside the community we have. But um, I, I feel like we're not trying to be alarming. And, uh, and I feel the support. I think I feel the support here of, uh, of I mean, the management of El Sarkal, of somebody uh, such as Abdel Munaim as well. Um, last week, there was also a message from, uh, from Nur al-Kabi, the Minister of Culture of the UAE, uh, who was, who, who spread this message of uh, of hope, like for the uh, for the creative community of uh, of the UAE? But uh, I think um, I'm thinking above the the region, you know, because I have a studio I have a studio in, in Tunis, and so part of my team is based there. And uh, and even if I'm I'm an Arab artist and I'm based here in Dubai as well, my work is more out of the Middle East in the Arab world than in the Arab world. So. That's uh, also a different concern that I think I have that maybe some people here uh, don't have as well, you know, who might not have, I think, that's how I should say. Uh, it, it sounds, uh, and of course, none of our audience will be surprised to hear that you're, you're very resilient and you're making the best of, of what is obviously a very difficult situation. Um, I'd like to turn now to Nadine, if I may. Um, and uh, I'll put to you, Nadine, the, the, the same kind of question with which I began, which is, could you give us some sense of, of the conditions on the ground? We're moving, um, we're flying now um, perhaps 1,000 miles, 1,500 miles from the Gulf to, to Beirut. Um, and as we land in Beirut, could you tell us what, uh, what, what, what the lay of the land is right now in terms of how people are, are coping in general to, uh, to COVID-19? Uh, hi, thank you for having me. Can you see me? I think there was a problem with the video. Can you see me? We yeah. can, thank you. Okay. Um, well, t- to tell you the truth, the situation here in uh, in, in Lebanon is, is very difficult. Uh, obviously, uh, 
you know that one third of the Lebanese population, unfortunately now because of the economical crisis, is living under the poverty line. So the the situation is uh, is hard on on many 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 people. Uh, you know, the people who are able to be confined and stay at home safely and eat uh, and have, uh, you know, all their basic needs uh, are doing okay. But there is a big, big portion of the population who uh, unfortunately uh, lives uh, with $4 a day. And those people have to uh, work on a daily basis in order to be able to eat and feed their families. So the situation is, is very difficult. Uh, I personally, of course, I have this small guilty pleasure of spending time with my family, with being close to my kids all the time, uh, being able to see uh, uh, and talk and understand what they think, uh, how how they are growing, because, you know, obviously we are very much, much closer than, than we used to be because we are, you know, spending every single moment of our day together. So it's allowing me, of course, to um, reconnect and uh, and understand uh, and reflect on the situation and try to think of the positive also uh, sides of you know this problem because i think there's a certain wisdom in nature if we don't believe in in uh, conspiracy theories and uh, we don't uh, and if we if i personally think that this is you know nature uh, trying to, in a way, um, shake us or wake us up or telling us, you know, at some point we need to stop and reflect and reflect on, you know, what we've done to this uh, earth and to this nature uh, and try to, um, you know, take some distance, understand, breathe, uh, think, uh, be on a sort of a standby mode uh, that allows us to really reflect uh, and, and reconnect even more because I truly believe that uh, nature is disconnecting us to uh, connect us, uh, connect, uh, connecting us even more after that, you know, to be able to reconnect in a, in a, in a, in a different way after that. In a, because we understand now, um, I think the the beauty of 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 you know human touch, the beauty of being close to the people we love, the beauty of just you know being close to our parents, the beauty of just you know being connected to another human being and 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 sharing beautiful things. And I think nature is reminding us of how beautiful it is and reminding us of how we were, in a way, it sounds a little bit cliche, but I really, truly believe in that. There's a certain wisdom, you know, just to see nature breathe and nature be so beautiful again and nature be so relieved from what we've done as human beings and how ugly we have become and how, I try to see the good side of it. I try to see that, you know, after that, I think we're gonna, uh, we there's a there's the it's the birth of a new world i think it's the death of a certain kind of world and it's the rebirth of a new world uh, a new system altern an alternative way of, of thinking an alternative system that will really be more careful and listen more to the real human nature and not some kind of um preconceived ideas of what we need as human beings we have understood that we need very little actually to be to survive we need very little to be okay or to be happy or so, uh, so. but still you know the, the the fact that that there's so many people living it very um uh, struggling to really live with that is 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 difficult. To, it's difficult to live with. We, you know, we're all we're always thinking of that the whole time. How do we how do we cope? How do we how do we create this kind of um, connection between us to be able to help people who are in need or or not being able to cope? Or, you know. So so that 
Thank you so much for that um, wise and even poetic response, if I may. Leave it to um, a filmmaker and an artist to, um, to look above and beyond um, some of the quotidian and, 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 um, and inhibiting constraints that, that, is, uh, that are so much part of our lives uh, to, to imagine already. And that's a theme to which I'd like to return. In particular, just um, how shall I put it, the brute facticity of biology and nature. It's quite humbling for us humans right now. And I think as you're suggesting the Dean, there's something quite, quite edifying in the moment in which we find ourselves. So I'll return to that. But Hood, if I may uh, fly back from Beirut to the Gulf, um, to Sharjah, and uh, ask you from your perspective uh, as a leader in the arts and culture community um, to give us some sense of how Sharjah is, is coping, um, the, uh, uh, the sense um, that uh, you and uh, your friends, family, and, and co-patriots are making of the current circumstances. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, well, as uh, Elsie mentioned, that the lockdown in the UAE, I think Dubai is on a stricter lockdown at the moment. It's like a 24-hour lockdown uh, recently. Um, but the UAE is really trying to test everybody. They're uh, driving testing centers everywhere. Um, it's very difficult to know when things are gonna go back to normal. So um, I think it's important to slow down. Uh, we've been bombarded with lots of um, programs from different institutions. And of course, everybody wants to put their projects online. We put our film screenings online as well. But I think um, sometimes it's too much information and maybe we should slow down, step back and share each other's uh, work together globally since we're all connected. Um, there, we've been very active at the foundation and all the other institutions in the UAE. So we've had a lot of pending uh, projects that have taken us way too long. And this is a good opportunity to catch up, for example, with uh, publications, research, translations. Um, at the moment, um, uh, we've uh, People still have their jobs, people still have their salaries. The government has taken that into consideration. A lot of um, private um, entities have provided uh, rent free for certain um, businesses or uh, apartments um, in the private sector. So I think so far we're hoping that for the next two, three months, it, it should be okay. But I see people have been asking about um, when our, our projects or exhibitions will will take place. So I think we, we just have to keep saying, uh, you know, uh, dates to be confirmed or subject to change as we don't know really um, how long this would last. But I think uh, we continue to to work as usual, but also yeah, take our time. What do you imagine given the, the the really important role that Charge and the Biennial play in, in the art world, what are your concerns about the impact of, of those postponements, of those cancellations? Um, and you know, have you begun yeah. to think about how you, how, you, um, how you respond to those? Yeah, I mean, people who know me know I haven't, I'm not a fan of virtual exhibitions. I've never been a fan of virtual exhibitions because I don't feel it's the same experience as going to visit an exhibition. It's not the same artwork that you see in front of you. It's not the same experience. But I think there are other ways to interact with people through texts, through uh, videos, through uh, screenings. So I think you know that 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 could work. But at the same time, all of this is out of our hands. I think it's really hard to control or to try to understand what's happening. Um, so I I think it's I don't want to say just you know to go with the flow, but. I can't be optimistic or, or, or pessimistic because I, I don't really know how long this would last. Um, but as I said, there's always other ways of engaging with, with communities and audiences as we're doing now digitally. But I think it also takes things on a global, global level. Um, and we've seen, I've had many emails from different galleries and institutions sharing artists' work uh, and, and films 
um, as links and asking us to share it with other people. And I think that's really very important because artists still get their works viewed. See, turning back to you, what I've, I, 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 if you could share with us um, your current thinking, um, given how grounded your work is in specific communities, indeed disadvantaged communities, communities that, um, that are perhaps or almost certainly um, experiencing um, uh, the pandemic in ways that, uh, that many of us can, can scarcely imagine. I think of, of your work with Isabelin in Cairo, um, the work that you do, which, is, um, which has real community impact. How, how have the current circumstances affected your short-term thinking? What projects um, have you begun to envision um, that could make an intervention sooner rather than later so that, um, so that uh, uh, the perspectives and, and the, the powerful impact that artists can have in ameliorating in, in, um, in drawing attention to those inequalities, drawing attention to uh, how those communities um, suffer disproportionately. Are there, are there ways in which you're thinking about your art in that kind of interventionist way? Yeah. Um, you know, we, um, uh, before, I mean, like, uh, be, being inside communities happened like, uh, before like the COVID-19, I think just, I mean, the fact that we have this disease right now, this virus, um right raise like um, a trigger in all of us that we should uh, we should give importance to uh, i mean to some people that are segregated because coronavirus doesn't segregate anybody we still at the same level you know the old the young the poor the rich so in a way we just all becoming i mean we're just feeling our common humanity and um and you know like uh Every project that I do, I try to stay in touch, you know, with the with the community that uh, I've worked with. For example, the people in the, in Manchet Nasser in the in the Cairo garbage neighborhood. Uh, I'm in touch with them. Like actually, I was talking to uh, one of the guys yesterday, and they told me like uh, they're fine there so far. Um, we had the project in South Lebanon a few months ago inside a, a refugee camp in Anel Helway. You know, we did this project uh, with some women who do a uh, Palestinian embroidery. And uh, same, I mean, uh, I, I reached out to them two days ago and uh, they told me that, uh, uh, thank God, you know, like they were, like they were no, no, nobody was sick inside the camp. And they were, she was telling me, this woman, Mahmoud, telling me that she was scared that if one person is sick, like, uh, I mean, it can propagate so far there. And, uh, and she was also uh, worried about the uh, economic uh, aspect of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this virus. But um, right now, uh, as an artist, I think um, I have a social responsibility to, uh, to, to make sure that even if I'm not acting on the ground, you know, I don't do my art project. It's important that uh, I find a way uh, to, uh, I don't know, to help people in a certain way. For example, we've been thinking with my team to, uh, to, to raise some money for the, uh, for the hospital of my, uh, of my town of Gabes in south of Tunisia. So I'm about to post something uh, soon on my, on my page. But uh, that's, I don't know, it just make us, uh, uh, I think, more concerned about other people. And, uh, and like I said, you know, I think we all equal at this, at this level. Everybody can be touched by this, uh, by this virus. And that's, um, I think this, I think the, I don't want to say the positive thing of it is of this virus is that he, he brought back our humanity. And I think I, I start, you, you kind of feel it, you know, and when you just check, you open the social media, I think you, you see that people are way more connected than before. Like I, I say, connected emotionally, not just connected for like an iPhone and, uh, and uh, I mean, connected digitally. I mean, there is a real emotion that you can see actually on your screen today. And uh, I think I appreciate that. Nadine, as Seed has, uh, his comments overlap with, with uh, the observations that you made earlier about the leveling effect, the humbling effect of the pandemic. Given your own work, your own filmmaking, given the position that you have as on the one hand, a filmmaker, an artist, on the other hand, one uh, who's clearly an activist and concerned with 
fundamental uh, questions of, of, uh, of democracy, um, are there ways in which you can envision, again, in the short and middle term, avenues of intervention that, that um, advance some of, your, some of your concerns? I mean, um, we've I've been trying to, uh, you know, think of, because this is such a new uh, situation to us and I'm not, uh, I'm not some, somebody who's, uh, who likes technology a lot and I'm not used to, um, I'm, I'm not used to communi communicating a lot through, uh, I mean, I have, of course I have social media and all that, but I'm not, I'm not a professional in all these things. So it's the, the, the situation, uh, I'm, I was still trying to figure out what is my responsibility and how, how do I, how do I turn my obsessions or my frustrations toward the situation or, or toward being paralyzed physically in a way because we are confined. Uh, this is a, a sort of, we're a little bit paralyzed physically. How do I comp compensate? And, and you know, we, 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 I figured out ways, you know, I, I was a little, I was, uh, um, participating in a in a fundraising sort of a fundraising event for uh, some of the organizations that are working on the ground. We came up with a campaign, with a beautiful campaign, and trying to, you know, fundraise over the internet for those organizations who've been uh, working on the ground for a very long time, and who, with the participation of a hundred other organizations, are trying to map you know, all the needs and map all the families that are in need all over the country in a way and create this network of uh, you know, people helping each other out, of organizations helping each other out in order to be able to uh, get to all, you know, all the communities who are sort of in need. Uh, we're trying, I personally think that the most important thing to do is really now promote urban farming, promote urban ag agriculture, promote agriculture in general, you know, um, promote this idea in people's head to go back to nature, to work their small land or whatever land next to their house there is, maybe plant on the rooftop, do some kind of rooftop farming, plant on their balcony, plant on the small terrace they have in order to be self-sufficient, in order to be able to attend to, you know, each one's needs without really having to rely on charity all the time. And I think it's the only way. For me, I think this is the only way, uh, maybe not even in Lebanon, it's the only way I think all over the world is really to go back to nature, go back to and connect with the generosity of nature and know how to work with nature to be able to you know, rely uh, on ourselves. And, and so I'm trying to also promote, promote that in a way. When it, you know, when it comes to my own work as a filmmaker or ideas or, you know, creative ideas about, you know, maybe upcoming films or upcoming um, projects, I'm still a little bit, uh, I don't know if it's lazy. I'm, I don't know if I'm lazy or I don't know if I am trying maybe to reflect or have some distance with what's happening before trying to have any ideas. You know, people ask me, so how, what are you working on? Uh, I mean, I don't want to disappoint everybody, but I'm not working on anything uh, really uh, because uh, my mind is not very clear. And I need to really take some distance, reflect, think about all what's happening. And, you know, maybe the idea will come so, when it comes. So I, I, think, uh, I think most everyone online would, would agree that uh, we all find ourselves in positions in which we're, um, we're really trying to make sense of, of, of the world from one minute to the next. Um, but as moderator, it's my prerogative. I get to push you as, as much as I as much as I feel I should. And so what I'm going to begin as a word to, to uh, a third and final round of questions by asking you in, in a, and I know this is terribly presumptuous, it's extremely premature, 
we're, we're all very much responding, as I said a, a moment ago, from one minute or one day to the next. But what kind of, how do you begin to envision uh, this, whatever that new normal looks like? Uh, a new normal which um, may be in terms of uh, um, financial capacity, very different. A new normal in which, um, Crowded exhibition halls may not be the primary way that one judges the success of, uh, of a show. Uh, a new normal in which um, the international travel from which DC, New York, but also the Gulf benefit uh, enormously. What preliminary, again, I underline that it's, it's presumptuous of me, but what kind of preliminary thinking have you and colleagues begun to do to imagine uh, uh, an arts future in that new normal? Before I answer, I just wanna comment on one thing that Nadine said. Um, I was having a conversation today with my father about um, how people are pushing for local produce and the fishermen are very pleased because they haven't been able to sell this much fish in the past because of competition of other types of fish being uh, brought into the country um, and the same with the local farmers. So I think there are some people that feel like they're benefiting, which is the local fishermen and, and, and the farmers, uh, which is something positive and hopefully people will continue to buy local after, after this. Um, in terms of uh, crowded exhibitions, yes, I agree with you. I've, I've never been a fan of very crowded exhibitions. I'm, uh, quite short and don't get to see much sometimes when we go to Tate or <laughs> or MoMA on a busy day. So I, I never judge the success of an exhibition on the crowds. Um, and um, I mean, the, the nice thing and what I love about the Art Foundation is our spaces actually spill out into courtyards. So you're never really all congested into, into a single space or, or mingling inside. People tend to mingle outside, which is nice. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe hopefully, you know, when we have biennials, uh, the, the exhibition is on for three months, maybe people don't necessarily tend to come at the beginning and leave, you know, people could, um, you know, come throughout the three months, um, we could have certain programming where uh, things are repeated, for example, so people can come in, in at different times rather than having to crowd. I mean, I was talking to some people about um, another project I'm working on and we're looking at a performance hall. And then there's this idea of how a performance hall has to be crowded for the audience, for the, for the people on stage because it has to create this crowd so you can have a dialogue. But I didn't, but then I asked, you know, what's gonna happen with the social distancing? Are we still gonna have to have crowded halls and these are questions that are global questions I think we're all going to have to to think about it um, but you know you can't take away the experience in person and as much as I am always online and I am a digital person um, I I still don't see it as a, as a substitute and see if I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you thank you <laughs> and see if I can put the same question to you what Please uh, wax as utopian as you wish to. Um, what, what in your view might that new normal look like and what kind of role do you think you could play in it? Well, um, I, I don't know. I'm, uh, you know. I don't like this, uh, this uh, glass ball, I will say like, uh, I don't know the future, but uh, I, <laughs> I sincerely think that, you know, uh, I think the, the change will come from, from us, from the people, you know, like uh, from, from the bottom, I would say. And, um, you know, looking at what uh, Nadine said or what Hul said about uh, the fishermen in Sharjah, I think it's, uh, it's important that we start thinking like that. You know, we start thinking of communities and being uh, able to say, okay, what, what change can I make around me? You know what I mean? And... Uh, and I think this is a little gesture that you do on your daily life around you that can, I think, have a bigger impact. But um, I want to be positive, you know. I, uh, I I try. I always look at the situation in the most positive way. So I I know it's difficult, you know. Like um, we, you know, me as an artist, I I it's not only myself. I have a, I have a team of uh, we're a team of eight people, you know, in my studio. So 
Uh, I need to make sure I, I pay the salary of my team. I need to make sure I pay the rent of my studio, even if the studio is are closed those days. So you know there is a there is a certain worry, but in the same time, I think um, we should in this time work as a community and see how each one uh, can help the other one. And many, um, you know, there was a question on the uh, from one of the participants was saying is art uh, uh, a luxury or a necessity? And uh, I, I responded like anonymously, uh, if you're watching Netflix, you know, uh, during the lockdown, if you're listening to music uh, during this lockdown, if you're reading books you know, from writer during this lockdown, I think art is not a luxury, it's a, it's a necessity, you know, and, um, and we realized that this is important that, uh, you know, art is, not a luxury it's a it's a it's yeah it's something that that we need that help us to reflect to think in a different way and uh, and us as artists and uh, artistic actor i think this is our responsibility to to show i don't want to say show the example because i don't think i'm anybody or i shouldn't i don't have the voice to to show the example but to uh yeah to to try to create a change around us and that's that's what i'm trying to do with my work i guess Nadine, it, you um, you provided some powerful language earlier in the conversation, even indeed uh, a poetic language. Um, are there ways in which you're you're imagining that your intervention as an artist, as a filmmaker, will try to capture this moment so we don't forget it? That is, of course, uh, the great uh, the the one of the great perils uh, in in the world is as changeable as it is. Is that um, we may revert to, um, shall we say, that style of life which is less reflective upon some of the themes that you drew out of, um, of sustainability, biology, local, the family. How, how, how might you or, or how might you imagine other artists could help us record this moment? Um, I've always, you know, believed in the and the responsibility of artists and art and the mission that we have as artists and what art can really do. I've always, I've always believed in the power of art in, in, in change, the power of art, at least creating, if, if it doesn't ignite change, it creates a debate, it asks the right uh, questions, it reflects on certain issues and makes you as a viewer or as a receiver reflect on the same issues. So I've always been, I've always really truly believed in that. And I think it's one of the most powerful tools uh, for change is art, because through art you are talking to um, uh, uh, the emotional frequency of you, the receiver, you're talking, you're talking on a, on a, on the emotional level and the emotional frequency. And through emotional frequency, you can really, I think, uh, ignite uh, action because it's it's really through what you're feeling that that I think this emotion gives you wings and makes you want to change things and do things and and change your reality if you're not happy or. You know, I, I truly believe in, in, in this emotional frequency and art talk to, talks to you as a human being on this emotional frequency. So I, I, I think that through art, I think we're gonna be uh, uh, debating a lot of issues. We're gonna be asking lots of questions, whether through films or paintings or graffiti or music or poetry or, or literature, I think we're going to be asking the right questions and through asking the right questions or at least tackling the right issues. Uh, this is going to create lots of reflections and lots of debates and this is it's through this I think we're going to be able uh, to imagine, I think, a new world, to imagine a new system, to imagine a, a world that is um, more uh, you know, that, that is more, that listens more to the real human nature and to the real human need. Uh, you know, it's gonna be tackling uh, the distribution of wealth, I'm sure. It's gonna be tackling hunger. It's gonna be tackling uh, social injustice. It's gonna be tackling, uh, you know, nothing is going right. Nothing, nothing is going the way it should be. Uh, 
And it's not surprising what's happening. I think this wake up call was bound to happen sooner or later. Uh, you know, there are studies that say that in 2050, if we did not reduce the pollution levels, uh, the world is, might, you know, end. It's, it might be the end of humanity. Uh, and nature is very clever in creating this wake up call. And, in, and through this wake up call, I think we're gonna start, we're gonna start, I might seem a little bit naive, but it's also my nature. I'm somebody who's very hopeful and very positive. I truly believe in the power that we have as human being to change through whatever uh, platform or, or medium we have, whatever tool we have, we can make a change. And uh, and I think, think that through art, we're going to be able to at least um, propose a new system, an alternative system, a new way of, an alternative way of thinking, and it's really needed. Hoda, I think it must be the case that you are a patron of the arts um, and a leader of the arts precisely because um, you so deeply respect the visionary function that artists such as Alcide and uh, and Nadine clearly have in reminding us of these, these perennial questions, uh, the, the responsibility that they take upon themselves to envision new futures, these new futures. On the other hand, you will know um, that uh, the great majority of artists practicing in the Middle East and North Africa, but elsewhere as well, are self-employed. They're freelancers. Uh, they, uh, they lead lives that are precarious in many respects. What are the ways in which governments, or organizations and civil society, foundations, what are the ways in which um, you, uh, do you think that they should be supporting artists currently mm -hmm. uh, precisely so that their role, so that we, uh, uh, the society at large doesn't lose, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, we don't stop hearing those important voices and, and, and we're deprived of those uh, different imaginings of a future. Yeah, well, when, when I started working uh, at the foundation, when I set up the foundation and everything, it's because I grew up as an artist and realized there was so much missing that needed to happen. So in a way, I, I understand what opportunities are needed and I realized that uh, I could um, play the role in trying to make these things happen and bringing uh, different across dis disciplinary uh, cultural projects. So uh, at the foundation, which is a government run foundation, it's not a private uh, foundation. We have uh, many grants that we continue to offer. We have a, a production program grant um, every two years. We have a a film platform with a film grant. We have um, a grant for uh, publications. So we, we continue those projects, but at the same time, we select, you know, a few that, that come, come through. We have a jury, uh, international jury, who we would also, um, um, you know, hire or, or, or offer a fee for. To, to select those. So there are these different opportunities where we can work with people. I had a meeting this morning with um, the Minister of Culture, the UAE Minister of Culture, uh, as part of a cultural uh, council uh, where they've been discussing um, opportunities and funding for um, creative industries, uh, freelance artists, designers, um, and um, writers that um, could help support them at this time. So there, there are discussions that are happening at, at the federal level as well, which is really very important. Um, but I think it, it's our responsibility to help each other as much as we can. Um, we all have many contacts. We have many um, um, people that we could uh, support in terms of writers and you know publications and things like that. So I think, you know, we have to just um, try and, and do that at this time when people need the need their us, our support. Yeah. So I've been getting some uh, terrific questions from our from our audience. In fact, I've already begun to draw upon them, um, and several speak to a, a, an issue that I'm sure um, all of you can speak to. And so I, I throw this question out to to uh, to any of you to respond as you wish. Um, 
If nothing else, the technology reminds us that, that international collaboration is very possible. So what kind of opportunities can you see for uh, collaboration either within the Middle East or internationally, specifically between um, the Middle East and the United States? Are there opportunities now that, that we should be grasping? Are there particular collaborations that you're, that you're excited about, templates that already exist, examples that you'd like to discuss? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, as I said, I think uh, we have to share our platforms with each other. I think it's a time to work together and not look at it as some sort of uh, museums competing to, to, to have a better exhibition or to have a bigger number of audience. And I think um, it's an important time to, to share our program and to share, as I said, um, links to uh, artist films or um, talks or programs like this. Nadine or El Cid, would you wish to, um, uh, are there particular ways in which uh, technology or a different set of attitudes um, um, might foster collaborations that, that, that you haven't had in the past? In the, in the past? The, the, Nadine, many of the themes that you've been articulating um, are uh, certainly not specific uh, to, to Beirut, to Lebanon, um, or indeed to the Middle East. Are there ways in which there are lessons that artists practicing in the Middle East can teach those of us who work outside of the Middle East? Um, yeah, I, I, will, I will just mention something. Yeah, as an artist, uh, I think, you know, like the, the fact that we're connected through, uh, through social media is uh, allow us to exchange, you know, so I think there is this feeling of collaborating and exchanging me as an artist with other artists all, all around the world was something that was present in my, uh, in my practice already. But I think this confinement, the fact that we're locked down today, like uh, just, um, like I said, was sometimes triggered, like, uh, I don't remind me of people that I didn't, uh, was not in touch for a long, long time. And, uh, and I think this is what it creates, but uh, collaborating, I don't think the, on my side, I don't think the, the lockdown of the virus today um, nourish something new at this level. I think this is, um, I've been always open to any collaboration and to discuss with any artists from different fields around the world. And, uh, and I'm actually, I'm feeling that today more and more. I have a question from, um, from New York, which touches on one of the, the themes that we've um, we've already mentioned. I work as a realtor and this crisis pushed me to be more connected through engaging with people differently. Um, do you think it is an occasion to democratize art and culture to connect with marginalized people in a different manner? How can we bridge the gap between providing online free art and supporting artists in a way that they can lead their lives and live from? Um, I have to point, uh, uh, make a point. Uh, well, the work that we do at the foundation and a lot of institutions actually in, in the UAE are free and open to the public. So I think the, the question is a little bit um, about probably museums that are ticketed and, and perhaps. Um, online, I'm not so sure. I think um, it depends. I think there are galleries that put their artists work online, but everybody's able to also um, submit their work on and create their own website. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I quite understand that question very well. Nadine or El Cid, would you, would you wish to, uh, to respond? How does one square the circle between um, a, a wish on the one hand to make art as freely available as possible and, and let's try to stay on theme as it were, art that responds to the particular moment um, perhaps in a, in a very urgent way with uh, the need on the part of artists to, uh, to, to, um, to sustain themselves? Um, I, I'm not sure, personally, I'm not sure. I, I know, I know the answer because I think uh, we're gonna find, we're gonna find the answer. We're gonna find the system if the situation goes on uh, 
I don't think it will go, go on forever, but uh, I think we will adapt and we will find ways. I'm not sure which, which, which one is the right way, how it's going to, it's not really my, um, my obsession for the moment, but uh, I'm sure we will find ways to do it. I, I personally don't have an answer to that. I don't know if Elsie has, has it. I, I don't think I have an answer to uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I think you know democratizing art uh, uh, I think who said it you know like the fact of opening museum in a, a freely uh, exhibition as well for people is a, is a way of democratizing it me as a you know I'm an artist but uh, people know me as a street artist so my work is mostly on the street so the fact that is on the street is already democratized you know so I'm, I'm giving it to the people so um, so yeah, then now the gap between supporting, uh, I'm, I'm reading the question at the same time, the gap, trying to bridge the gap between providing online free art and supporting artists in the way they can live from their art. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you can always support artists in so many ways, you know, like, like you know, by purchasing anything, like a, a book, uh, a canvas, a little a poster, anything, you know, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's a different subject. No. So I won't be the only um, uh, person listening to your comments who, who works in an art museum. What, how should museums be responding? Um, Hora, I can start with you. What, what, how would you like to, to, to see museums responding to the current circumstances? Um, tough one. Um, I think when we discussed earlier about overcrowded museums, I think that's going to be an issue, definitely. Um, I'm not sure how they could um, limit their numbers because of uh, those exhibitions are always overprescribed and you have to queue up and, and book your, your tickets online. Um, I think, as El Cid said, to, to have the work accessible to the community, um, maybe to, to do things outdoors, um, you know, we do a lot of projects outdoors in, in Sharjah. Um, we have, uh, you know, public screenings and uh, performances because those are the works that really connect to communities that wouldn't necessarily um, plan to come to your exhibition. You know, they, they're just people who are passing by. And uh, we've been doing that for a number of years now. Um, nearly, well, it's going to be the 15th biennial, so nearly 30 years now in Sharjah. So um, people are used to this public interaction, and it's really difficult not to have public programming right now, but we also don't want to encourage people to go out. <laughs> we want people to stay at home. So we've um, put, um, we've continued our film screenings. We've just moved them online for the time being. Um, but, you know, hopefully we can go back to, to having more community spaces and, uh, having things that would just be accessible to people passing by. All three of you know that um, museums, uh, particularly those that rely upon ticketing revenue are, are having a very, very difficult time. Um, the Smithsonian, our entrance is free, I'm very, very proud to say, um, uh, but because of the imperatives of, uh, of uh, of uh, public health and self safety, we, we, we closed our doors um, on the 13th of March and we remain closed and will remain closed indefinitely until matters clarify. Now that's obviously uh, forced upon us as, uh, to accelerate our efforts in, in making more of our collection and indeed more of our, our physical assets, if I may, uh, both in the form of, of collections as well as recordings or performances, exhibitions, available online, um, virtually. And I think the three of us, four of us can all agree that that's not the same as the, as the physical experience. And yet it is, it, is, it, it is that possibility in the future that that increasingly has to become the norm for any number of reasons. To, uh, to the two artists on the, on the panel, how do you, how do you feel about uh, a, a museum culture um, which increasingly has to privilege the virtual, the online, over the physical. For me as an artist, it's, uh, I don't know, I, uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm not a virtual person, you know, like uh, 
uh, I, I like to see, I, even for my work, you know, uh, I try to do virtual stuff, you know, but I like when it's true, when I can see it, can I touch it? And, uh, and also experiencing, I think, from my audience, my, my work on the picture and like in real is totally different, you know, so, uh, so I don't know. I hope, uh, I hope there's not going to be any switch into like a more virtual life and more virtual art <laughs> after the COVID-19. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that we still need to have like uh, something like real in front of us, you know, that's what connects us, you know, we're real. So we need, we need to stay in the reality. And, and, and if I may press you a little bit, how do you respond to, um, to, uh, to the virtual realities that are becoming increasingly uh, more realistic, if I may? The experiences that can take place um, individually, which feel very collective, feel very embedded. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, an extent, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I tried in some of my projects to bring some virtual reality. For example, we wanted when we did the project inside the, the garbage city of Cairo uh, to bring this virtual reality, you know, like and make sure that people could feel the, uh, the experience. But then, unfortunately, we, uh, we, we didn't do it. But um, it would have given some people like a different experience of, uh, of, of the art piece, but uh, and, and different experience and feeling of, of the environment. Of course, that is different than the picture or video, but uh, I think like real life is still uh, still on top of the list for me, you know. So that's why that's why, I, like I said, I'm I'm not frustrated to be uh, at home, you know. But uh, I I I would say I, I miss I miss being in the street and I miss painting in the street. Yeah. Nadine, did you want to add something? You were you were nodding your head. No, I was just uh, I mean. For me, it's uh, the, the heart of my work is really working with people and uh, and observing human nature and uh, working closely to actors and being very even physically very close and very intimate. Uh, so obviously, yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of virtual um, realities and virtual art. I think at some point, if if we're gonna have to. Uh, cope with that we will find ways to do it uh, but of course uh, you know human the human aspect of things and the reality of uh, human connections and being there being present uh, being close I'm, I'm a very tactile person too uh, it, you know even being able to uh, smell that person or you know it's 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 a completely different uh, approach to things and uh, I, I I still need that I still need that in my work it's very important to me well I, I uh, we're, we, we have run out of time I, I do want to share with you um, a um, uh, one question uh, which uh, to which I don't expect you to answer, but I do want to give you the opportunity if, if you um, if you have any final thoughts. Considering, uh, uh, a colleague writes, that the Black Death was followed by the Renaissance, is another golden era for art on the horizon? Um, I, I, as I said, I don't expect necessarily for you to answer the question, um, but it certainly, uh, at least that reading of history would give rise to some optimism. Um, any final comments that that our uh, our speakers from Dubai, Sharjah, and and Beirut would like to make um, uh, as as we close up? Uh, for me, I just want to thank you for this op opportunity, and uh, it's new to me. Uh, I think it's going to happen more and more. This is the first time I do this. Uh, I, I have a feeling. Um, that this is going to be a way of communicating between each other and uh, sharing ideas, which is another maybe positive uh, aspect to all of, all of that is that uh, we are, uh, I think we are more able to reflect on things because we are not running around all the time, each one in their world and their bubble trying to work. I mean, there's a certain, there's a, there's a certain connection between people that is happening uh, 
and 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 this is another example what's happening today is another example i, I don't think this uh, would have happened otherwise and it's happening more and more uh, across the world and those reflecting bubbles are duplicated around the world at such a such a quick uh, speed which is great it is great. And on that very optimistic note, I do want to thank our three panelists. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, my colleagues at the Middle East Institute. And of course, I'd like to thank our global audience for joining us. Thank you all very much and have a very good day. Thank you. Kate. Thank you. Thank you.